It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I have the privilege of talking to healthy people for a change, and in my job, unfortunately, I see people after the fact. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy this opportunity. Uh, how many of you have had anyone in your family, whether it's grandparents, great-grandparents, or parents, who've had some problem with heart disease or strokes or circulatory problems? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, that's why I do this talk, because it is the number one killer in our nation. And a lot of people fear cancer and other conditions, but heart disease is still the number one killer. And Kentucky ranks right up there. Anybody have any guesses why Kentucky has some pretty bad statistics? What are we known for in the state of Kentucky? Smoking. Smoking. One of, our, of course, that's one of our industries. And uh, so we've had a lot of people opposing the, the bans for smoking, and a lot of people don't want to quit smoking. Uh, one of my things that I tell the patients is the best diet in the world will not help you if you continue to smoke because you'll do, undo all the benefits that you gain from controlling your cholesterol if you're a smoker. Um, also, I've got several things to show you today about cholesterol and, and how your diet affects your cholesterol levels. I used to bring out some real arteries and, and they have uh, unfortunately dried out years ago. Uh, these were real arteries from patients who had abdominal aneurysms. And if you've had anatomy class, you know that's the main artery located in your midsection. It's a large artery. It's about this, oh, it's bigger than my thumb. And sometimes that can become like a, a tire. Have you ever had a, a tire that got a knot on it? So you were afraid to drive it because you know there was always that possibility you'd have a blowout. People can have aneurysms and not even know it. And what it is is a weakened area of that artery. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't even make it to the hospital. The fortunate ones are the ones who maybe went for a routine exam and on x-rays they found it. So we're trying to prevent that type of thing today with this lecture so you can have a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet and perhaps never have a problem until you're 90 years old and fall off a mountain climbing. So we want to have a healthy life as long as possible. I'm going to start out maybe with something that will be mostly uh, more interesting to you and that is the effect of fast foods on our lives. Um, sometimes I tell stories about my great grandparents and you guys don't even have uh, ancestors that old but when I was a little girl we would go down to the country where my grandparents lived and they lived to be 86 years old and still ate lard every day they ate eggs every morning for breakfast they had the country ham and the bacon but they still lived to be 86 and a lot of my patients will tell me you know I don't know why I have to watch that because their grandparents ate like that and still lived to be an old age what do you think the difference in the lives of my great-grandparents and of our population today. What is the big difference? Exercise, Exercise is a biggie, because these great-grandparents, one of the reasons we went to see them besides wanting to visit with them is that they didn't have a car, and we had to take them to the grocery store. And I remember them buying five-gallon containers of lard. How do you use lard? You young people probably know how lard was used. How was lard used in their diets? Fried, it was used to fry. A lot of people still hold out and say that fish is better if it's in lard. So it was, they fried their chicken, they fried their fish, they fried their potatoes in lard. But what are some other ways they would use lard? Yes, it was in the food. It was the fat that was in the biscuits or the bread or cornbread or whatever they might you know, put the cakes and cookies and pies was used that way. It was also used as just a seasoning in those vegetables. What else was used in those vegetables as seasoning? That ham hock I mentioned, the bacon that I mentioned. So they had a lot of grease in their diet, and yet they lived to be uh, late into their 80s. Another difference is we talked about the exercise. My grandparents did not have a tractor either, and yet they raised a big garden every year. Uh, he did that by walking behind the mule with that plow that went through the ground. So he got lots of exercise. My grandmother cooked on a stove that was wood burning. So somebody had chopped wood and bid the fire before she could even cook breakfast. And breakfast was very important then. Uh, so there's a big difference in the exercise and what is our diet like today in comparison to that diet? Most of us don't use lard. Does anybody still use lard in here? No? Okay. Um, so you don't use lard, so is your diet better than the diet of several decades ago or generations ago? Where do people of today eat? Fast foods perhaps? So let's take a look at fast foods. Uh, if you were to go to one of the more popular fast food restaurants, let's say you went to McDonald's, 
and you bought the small burger. Do you have any idea how much fat you're getting from that? How much fat should you have in your diet? What is the recommendation? The recommendation is no more than 30% of your total calories. And for most of you, that would be maybe about 60 grams of fat a day. For a very conservative, moderate amount, let's say that your budget for fat for the day is 50 grams. So keep that number in mind as I tell you these, these numbers. If you bought that McDonald's small hamburger, and I am talking about the little one that you probably just get for the younger brother or sister. It's so small that you have to peel the bun apart to make sure they remember to put the meat on there. It's only one and a half ounces of ground beef, and it has a total amount of 12 grams of fat. Why does it have that much fat? Flavor and taste. Uh, what are they using to make hamburger meat? Hamburgers. Well, obviously, they're not using the steak or the lean meat because they can sell that for a much better price. So anything that they cut off of that steak or that roast will cause scraps. So it's usually the fat and the extra little lean pieces of meat on the edges of that meat. They'll throw over in a meat grinder, and they grind it up and call it hamburger meat. And they can still get money out of that scrap meat by calling it hamburger meat. Do you ever notice the difference in the color of the hamburger meat versus a steak? What's the difference? The steak is very red, the hamburger meat is pink, maybe even light pink, maybe a whitish color. How do you get pink? What two colors do you mix to get pink? Red and white. What is the white in that meat that makes it turn pink? Fat. fat. <laughs> it is the fat. So the whiter the meat is, or the lighter pink it is, the more fat it has in it. And that's why that one and a half ounce hamburger still ends up having 12 grams of fat because it's made with lots of fat. At least 30% of it is fat. Now, if your budget was 50 and we just had a little tiny hamburger with 12 grams of fat, you're probably still thinking, well, that's not that bad. If you've had any lectures in nutrition before, you probably know that we as dietitians recommend a lot of white meat. White meat chicken, white meat turkey, and fish. Those are really good choices. So if you went to McDonald's and got their chicken sandwich because you wanted to be healthier today, you're now consuming 27 grams of fat. What just happened? How can that be? It's fried. And you'd be surprised how many people totally forget that the way it's prepared makes a big difference. They get the fried fish, they get the fried chicken, thinking this is a healthier choice today, I'm gonna eat healthy. And they got 27 grams of fat versus 12 that was in the smaller hamburger. Now, if you got the grilled chicken, that's an excellent choice. That would work just fine. But let's say that you got the Whopper, which most of you probably consider the normal size sandwich, and the Whopper has 38 grams of fat in it. And that's because it's about three ounces after it's cooked. Now that's 38 out of your budget, which was 50, and that was without cheese. If you got the cheeseburger, you would add at least another 10 grams of fat. So now we're up to 48, which is all right at budget, isn't it? And we've only had one sandwich. If we throw in an order of french fries, we can add another 10 grams of fat, and that's if we got the little order of french fries. And sometimes, you know, they ask if you want the super size. I noticed one restaurant had three different sizes of french fries that you can get. And that's one meal. What if you had gone to the drive-up window that morning on your way to school, and you got the biscuit, sausage, and egg, and it had 40 grams of fat in it. Now you have about double your budget, right at 100 grams of fat, and you haven't had supper. So we're gonna do good tonight. We're gonna have fish, because we all know fish is good for us. I just said so. You went to Long John Silver's, and you got a three-piece fish dinner with hush puppies, french fries, and coleslaw, and that had 70 grams of fat. Now we have about 170 grams of fat in our diet, and our budget was 50. Do you have a better understanding now of why we have problems with heart disease in this nation and why obesity is rampant? And what kind of exercise did we get in obtaining these fast foods? We probably drove our car there and uh, didn't do anything else in between. Now you still have an opportunity to walk around campus, so you're getting more exercise than the average person, but a lot of people, once they start their careers, are sitting at a table or a desk all day long. And the only exercise they will get is what they get maybe between their car and uh, the, the facility. And hopefully they'll build in some exercise. How many of you exercise on a regular basis? Very good. I hope that you will continue to do that forever because a lot of us, once we get out of school, stop exercising. And that's a big mistake. What are some of the advantages of exercise? Some of them are real obvious. 
What's an advantage of exercise or one of the reasons you do it? For the heart. A lot of times people look at me and they'll say, well, why do you exercise? You don't need to lose weight. We have this real strange concept of exercise in this nation that the only people who need to exercise are people who are trying to lose weight. And my answer to them is the reason I exercise is because I have a heart. And that is what I want to keep healthy. It's the old expression, if you don't use it, you lose it. So you exercise to keep that heart muscle tone as, long, as well as all your other muscles. What are some other reasons you might exercise? Yes, it is a natural way of, of, of dealing with stress or pain. It does release endorphins. So if you're all stressed out and you go exercise, you're going to feel better. That's a good thing. It does burn calories. You know, a lot of people associate it with weight loss. It definitely burns calories. Um, so it's a good thing for that. What else? Bones. It's good for your bones. The pull of the muscle on the bones strengthens them. The women are at high risk for osteoporosis, especially small bone women. And that is one of the ways we can fight back to keep our bones strong. One other thing has an effect on your cholesterol. Do you know what that is? It will increase your good cholesterol, your HDL. And that's the one thing we know that can improve your HDL is exercise. Now that doesn't mean being a busy person. I have a lot of housewives who say, oh, I drive the kids to dance and I drive the kids to school and I go pick them up after brownies, and, but they're in the car. And even though they're busy all day long, they're not getting exercise. We define exercise as something that gets your heart rate up, you have to sweat a little bit, perspire a little bit, uh, breathe a little extra hard. That's the real definition of exercise, not just being an active person and having an active lifestyle, but something that really makes you work. You want to do that, and we used to say three to five times a week for 30 minutes, now the recommendation is about an hour a day, uh, and maybe that'll include everything. How many of you wear pedometers? A pedometer is a great way of keeping track and begin keeping yourself honest on whether or not you're getting enough exercise. Uh, you can pick them up at Walmart for $10 or less. Keep that on every day and you, your goal is about 10,000 steps. Uh, you may walk 500 the first day and you think, is that all I did? Or another day you've been really busy and you look down and you've worked your way up and you're 5,000 steps. It helps you know that you, maybe you need to go out and after school or after work and do a little bit more and then you can monitor it day in, day out. A lot of us have to have something in writing or something visual, and I think the pedometer is a real good way to go for that, keeping you on track. Okay, what is your cholesterol supposed to be? Anybody haven't had it checked lately? Any ideas what you need to have as cholesterol? Well, years ago we used to tell people, or actually people used to go to their doctor, and they would say, uh, tell the, they would, the doctor would tell the patient, your, your cholesterol's okay. Didn't even tell them what it was. Now, I don't know why they didn't think we could handle numbers, but that was pretty commonplace. The doctor would say it's okay. They would tell them that it was okay but if it was between 200 and 300 because that's what a majority of the people in our population had. Those are the same people who had heart attacks and strokes. So then we, based on statistics, changed that advice and said that the cholesterol should be under 200. That's to get you in lower risk for developing those complications later in life. So you want a cholesterol under 200. Teenagers is a little lower than that, more like under 186. Now, you could be between 200 and 300, but that's still going to be high risk. Your HDL, which is the good cholesterol, should be as high as possible. And that means at least above, above 55 or 60. That's a good amount to have. And your LDL, which is like the bad cholesterol, it's like a fairy tale. You've got good guys and bad guys. HDL is the good guy. You want it to be high. LDL is the bad cholesterol. And we used to say it should be under 130. Now we're even saying maybe even lower than that, like under 100. Now, how does this cholesterol affect you? Well, I like to compare it to your kitchen drain. If you've ever cooked a fatty meat, let's say you cook bacon, how did you dispose of that bacon grease? Did you put it down the kitchen drain? Hopefully not, unless you like plumbers and paying $50 an hour to get that cleaned down after a little while. Because you know that you put that fat down there, it's eventually going to cause a blockage, and you're going to have a drain backing up on you. If we put lots of fat into our bodies, and that's that LDL, the bad kind, it starts to layer on the inside of that artery. It builds up and eventually you're going to have a blockage. So that's why we want to keep those, those levels down. When I used to bring the arteries out that I started explaining to you earlier, um, I told you they had an aneurysm on them. One of it also had a buildup about 50% in one of the little leg branches. And there were also some blood clots in that specimen when I first got it. And this, these two kind of work together, and this is how smoking can also tie in again. Smoking is the one thing we know will bring your HDL down. It depresses it, so that's another ha way it har is harmful to you. It also causes ulcerations on the inside of that artery, which is a good place for that fat to cling. 
and it starts building up that plaque formation. Uh, the blood clots can just be the finishing touch. You've already got an artery that is narrowed because of the buildup of fat, and then you have a blood clot come along and it hits in that spot. And the blood clot, when I first got this, was up in the ar larger area of the, the aorta. And it finally broke loose with all my handling of it. It was in a little plastic container. But I said, that's a great example of what happens in the body. A blood clot is forming and eventually breaks loose and flows on down to where the artery is more narrow, and now there's no blood flow. So an individual may think all of a sudden this has happened. It was probably building up for a while, but their foot goes cold from maybe the knee down. And um, the only thing they can do is go in there and open that up and hope to save that. What happens if you have a lack of blood supply to a part of your body? It dies. That's what a heart attack is. You know, if that part of the heart muscle that was supplied by a certain artery becomes blocked, that part of the, the heart muscle dies. We just hope that it's not one of the major arteries that would cause a fatal uh, event. So you want your cholesterol to be under 200. How much per day should you eat? How much could be included in your diet still be safe? Under 200 also. That's the, the recommendation. And that's why I'm going to talk about eggs to start with. This is one of the first things people identify with cholesterol. What part of the egg has the cholesterol in it? It's just the yellow or the yolk of the egg. When they first analyzed with the older tools, they decided that eggs had around 270 milligrams of cholesterol for one egg yolk. So the advice was that we not eat more than about two egg yolks a week. With more sophisticated testing, maybe with a change in the diet of the chicken, they decided it was only about 220 milligrams of cholesterol. Well, the recommendation is 200, so you can see we still don't want to eat two or three eggs at a time. Uh, we recommend as nutritionists that you eat only four egg yolks a week, but that includes what's cooked in your food. So if you're having cakes and puddings and pies and cornbread and meatloaf, anything that might have egg yolk in it, you want to try to keep that limited to four a week. Maybe it's two that you have as an egg at breakfast and the other two are in your food, or however you might want to do it. I do recommend that you designate a day that's egg day. Maybe you'll say, okay, on Sundays and Wednesdays we'll have eggs. And that kind of keeps you on track so you don't forget how many you've had this week. The egg white does not contain cholesterol. So one of the things you might want to consider doing is using more egg whites and still have your eggs that way. For example, I don't have eggs at breakfast very often, but I'll have them at supper sometimes because it's a quick, easy meal. But I'll have one egg yolk with three whites. And that way I've got plenty of eggs, so I'm satisfied. It's not like one egg is not, not going to go very far. But uh, I didn't have to buy anything special. And you can do that. You can buy the egg beaters or the scramblers. These products are real egg white with an artificial yolk. A lot of people use these. Um, you have to keep them refrigerated or in the freezer and thaw them out. So my technique is a little simpler. You don't have to buy any special things and it's not more expensive. Um, you can also cook without using the egg yolk. For example, you can put egg whites in your cake and it still tastes great. The egg yolk really doesn't affect the taste of that very much. The egg yolk mainly works in thickening a product. So if you're making a filling for a pie or a pudding, the egg yolk does help for it to thicken and set up. I have to tell my story about myself. I tried cooking things without egg yolks for a while, and it works great in cakes and brownies and cookies. You never notice the difference. You can even use an extra egg white if you need to for the moisture, and the egg white actually helps to leaven or make a product rise, so the product is even lighter and fluffier, and that's a good thing. But I tried to make a pecan pie without any egg yolks one time, and it rose nicely all over my oven. I had foam going everywhere, so that didn't work. So it, it will work in most products, but not things that are supposed to thicken with the egg yolk you would have to adjust your recipes. If you're cooking for the first time lower fat, you may want to get a, a tried and true cookbook, one that's already had these recipes tested so that you don't have a lot of failures. All right, what is another fat? Well, I mentioned lard earlier, so let's talk about that in just a minute. Where does the lard come from? Everybody's clear on that? Pork fat, yes. A lot of the young people don't know where we get lard. Again, we used to be down on the farm. They would kill the pigs in November because that way it didn't spoil. You cut the fat off and you put it in a big black kettle and you build a fire under it and you melt it down. That's called rendering the fat and that's how they use the fat uh, in cooking we talked about earlier. Nowadays, people don't even know you can still buy lard. I had a hard time even finding this container. This is considered 51% saturated fat. Now, saturated fat is the bad fat. So 51% of this is not good for you. What about shortening? How does that compare to lard? We're not really sure that the body knows the difference. It does say on, in plain letters on here, no cholesterol. So a lot of my patients used to say, I don't need your help. I just buy things that say no cholesterol. And I'd go, oh, you really need my help. 
because this product was just as bad, probably almost as bad as the lard. What's the texture of it? Because that tells you the story. The more liquid a fat, the better it is. The firmer or more solid a fat, or the harder it is, the worse it is for you. This is very much in texture like the lard, isn't it? So it's also what I call a man-made bad fat. But let's read the description. It says Crisco is made from the finest vegetable oils, and those could be soybean, palm, or sunflower, which are partially hydrogenated for freshness and consistency. Sounds really nice, doesn't it? But what did that just say? Does anybody have a clue? If you've had chemistry classes, you might have an idea of what you just read, but if not, it just sounded nice. What they really told you is they took oils and they made them saturated. They hardened them. That's why I said man-made bad. And one of those oils in, that was mentioned as one of our multiple choices, soybean, palm, and sunflower, palm oil is really bad fat. So even though it sounded really nice, what they really told you is they made it very much like lard and it's probably not much of an advantage to you. If you use this occasionally, for example, in that uh, frosting that requires that type of thing to make that decorator frosting, you don't eat it very often, you don't go to that many weddings, but if you're using that all the time, uh, again, the older population, like my mother used to think if you didn't put some shortening in the pan that everything would stick and you couldn't cook without it. Visited her one time, she lived in Arizona, and she said, I guess, I guess it's really a, a pain to have a daughter who's a dietitian, but she said, I guess you want me to bake these pork chops. And I said, well, that, that'd be good. So mother gets down her nine by 11 cake pan, puts those pork chops in there, and the way they measured back then, you know, was with this method, a big old hunk of shortening in there and put it in the oven and baked them, right? <laughs> That's called oven fried, <laughs> it's still fried. She thought if you didn't put at least a layer of oil in the bottom of the skillet, that everything would stick. I guess you never heard of you know, non-stick skillets and the non-stick sprays that you can use to keep things from sticking without having to use fat. But that's the, the uh, way we used to cook back then. What are the bad fats? I mentioned to you palm oil, and the other one is coconut oil. Have any of you ever used coconut oil? And for a while I had a container of it. It's really hard to locate. You don't find it a lot in the grocery store. So, um, why am I even, even mentioning it? Well, coconut oil is worse than lard. I said lard was 51% saturated fat. Coconut oil can be as much as 94% saturated fat, and I've seen them hydrogenate the coconut oil. Saw that in ice cream sandwiches one time. Now, would you think there'd be coconut oil in your ice cream sandwiches? You wouldn't think so, would you? It's not always obvious. Some other examples of products that contain coconut oil. Sometimes it's in your hot chocolate mixes. Why would it be in there? This is made from non-fat milk, and it's made with cocoa, which has most of the fat removed. Cocoa's not that bad. So why do they put coconut oil in it? What is it we really like about fat? We like that texture. We like that creamy texture that it has in the mouth. So if you want your, coconut, your cocoa or hot chocolate to be creamy, and you want it to have a longer shelf life so you don't have to pull it off and throw it away if it you know, goes out of date, use coconut oil, because coconut oil has a longer shelf life than animal fats would have. So that's why they use coconut oil in some of these products. Another product that's notorious for having coconut oil is whip topping or Cool Whip. If you've ever put this on top of the hot chocolate and it melted, you had this little oil slick floating around on top of your hot chocolate, that's what that was. That was coconut oil. And a lot of people say, well, I don't use you know hot whipped cream that often, maybe in May on the strawberry shortcake. And, and around the holidays on the pumpkin pie. But think about all those salad bars now that have those fluffy salads. You know, you mix jello with them and fruit, and people eat those quite often now. And that is usually something made from coconut oil as well. Even these fudge sticks, fudge grams, were made with coconut oil. What about um, cake mixes? What do you think's in those? This is the little Jiffy Mixes. They're quick and easy, and they're convenient, nice, small size. Well, the reason you can tell this is quite old is because they don't use as many of these bad fats as they used to, but this contained beef fat or lard. That was the fat of choice. So when people tell me, and I asked you earlier if anybody used lard, do any of you use cake mixes at home that you haven't checked out? Do you ever use a frozen pie crust or a ready-to-use pie crust? Do you buy any cakes or cookies from the bakery? There is a possibility that you're eating lard, but you just don't know it because you didn't ask what the ingredients were. 
So that, that's an important thing to take note of from now on. This is one of my favorites. Labeling is so much fun. And on the side of this popcorn container, and this is from a concession stand, it says in the ingredients are popcorn, salt, and edible oil. Don't you love it they didn't use motor oil in that? <laughs> didn't tell us what the oil was. So they kind of left it to your imagination. Do you know what they use in most popcorn concession stands in the way of oil? It is almost always coconut oil. As a mother of three children, I work for plenty of concession stands. I can tell you coconut oil is what they use. Um, it's kind of de deceiving in the name of it because when you hear the word oil, you think of a, of a liquid. And I told you earlier that a liquid fat is the better kind of fat to use. But coconut oil is worse than lard. Remember, it was 94% saturated fat. A lot of your snack foods that you would innocently eat, if you didn't read the label, sometimes contain things like palm oil, which is what this one had. Even the original Triscuits had palm oil in them. And I could go on and on. Even the cereals that we fed our kids for years had coconut oil and palm oils in them. And how sad that that's what we chose to feed the kids, and it was probably the worst one. I also want to mention to you about the labeling on foods and sometimes the deception that you run into there. This little bag of corn chips, as I mentioned to you earlier, 50 grams of fat is what we recommend per day for fat. And this one has 160 calories and 10 grams of fat. Well, you know, if you're really hungry for something crunchy and salty to go along with that sandwich, and you can have 50 and this is 10, you might say, okay, I'm going to do that. Well, read carefully because what they call a serving is one ounce, and this happens to be a two and one fourth ounce package. And even though it looks like a single serving size, this actually has 360 calories and 22 and a half grams of fat in it. Think that's a little misleading? So read the label for what it says and not what you'd like for it to say. And be really careful. Another thing is the dairy products. Dairy products naturally come with a lot of fat in them. Uh, the whole milk originally was about one and a half teaspoons of fat. So think of it as one and a half teaspoons of butter for an eight ounce serving. Now some of you drink a lot larger glass than that, but an eight ounce glass would have one and a half. Then we came out, the dairy industry came out with a product called 2% milk. Do you remember what they used to call 2% milk? It was called low fat milk. Did you notice a few years back they had to change the name on it? And now it's called reduced fat. Why is that? Well, for years, we didn't have any legal definitions of all these terms. What is low fat? How low do you have to be to be low fat? And so people could call it anything they wanted to because there was no one to stop them. Then we came out with a definition and we decided that low fat was three grams or less per serving. This no longer qualified to be called low fat. It's reduced fat because it still has five grams of fat in it. It is a little bit better than the whole milk, but it's not nearly as good for you as the fat-free milk or skim milk. This is just has a trace of fat in it. It's a much better product. Now, a lot of people say, well, it looks watered down. It looks diluted. The farmers tell me it's the Blue John. It's what they fed to the hogs, and I hear all those stories. And, of course, they don't like the taste of it. Naturally, they don't, because if you were raised on whole milk, this is very different. It looks different, for one thing. It looks uh, watered down. Now, to me, that's a preferred appearance because I'm used to it now. I was raised on that, too, and at first I thought this was kind of strange. But now that I'm used to it, because we are creatures of habit, we're humans, we have to take time to make adjustments. I prefer this, and I don't call it watered down. I call it light and delicate, and that stuff is thick, disgusting, and slimy. But it's what you get used to. Now, the dairy industry tells us that the majority of our population is now consuming 2% milk. So we've, we've come a long way to the... 2% milk. We took down one step, but we haven't gotten all the way to this. So they came up with another option. You have choices. And they came out with products like this one that's called Fat Free Plus. There's another company that calls theirs Fat Free Deluxe. And what this is is a fat free milk that tastes like and looks like 2%. You pay maybe a few more cents for it, but it would give you the healthy choice, but still taste like you wanted to taste and look like you wanted it to look. So that was their. Uh, their solution to getting people to drink fat-free milk and still, ha and still liking it. You probably knew when you came into class that I would not be recommending butter, although you hear a lot of controversy on that and sometimes get confused with all the media. Sometimes they'll tell you, well, margarine's not any better than butter. The truth is, if it's a hydrogenated margarine, like the stick margarines, 
it's very similar to the, the process I talked about with the shortening. If they take oils and they turn it into a stick margarine, they have hydrogenated it and saturated it, and it's probably not a lot better than butter. But that's not your only choice. You have all kinds of t soft tub margarines and liquid margarines, which are much less saturated fats, much better for you than the real butter or the hard stick margarines. So I do recommend, remember liquid fats are always better, so a liquid margarine is a good choice. Uh, you also can go with fat-free products that aren't even fat at all. Uh, these taste like butter, but they're not. And they have no calories and no fat. This one's real popular because it sprays. The only complaint I've ever heard is sometimes it doesn't spray where you aim, but that's a minor thing. And this is a good product to use to get a buttery taste on your foods without adding any fat or calories. Another product that's real popular, my favorite, is Butter Buds. This now comes in a container very similar to the Molly McButter. They're like butter salts. So they give your food a buttery flavor without adding any fat or calories. And this one is, is a good tasting one. That's my bias. They've also come out with products like Take Control or Smart Choice or Benicol. Now these products are regular margarines. They're a healthy type of margarine. They have an additional benefit and that is that they've added plant stanols or sterols to these products which can bring down your cholesterol. Now they do cost about three dollars versus the other products which may be a dollar or less but when you consider that some of the cholesterol lowering medications can be as much as a dollar a pill they're a whole lot cheaper than that and they still taste good they still work like any other margarine you usually have a choice of a regular margarine full fat and calories or a light version which either one would be good but the advantage is that these additional plant stanols and sterols help to bring your cholesterol down several points and that's that's a good thing now if you want to get the fried effect I mentioned earlier you can use a nonstick spray like Pam this of course is the Walmart brand great value and that way you could cook the egg tastes like it's fried but it didn't add any calories or fat grams to it so that's another option Salad bars are another interesting event today. You remember when salad bars used to be lettuce and vegetables, raw vegetables? What's on a salad bar today? Almost everything but, right? I mean, you can still get the lettuce. But did you ever notice when somebody walks away from the salad bar, they have this little mountain and it's white covered, you know, it's snow covered, you can't see any lettuce at all? What's going on there? Lots of salad dressing. Did you know what an average salad dressing bottle reports the serving size to be? It's like two tablespoons. Did you ever see anybody use only two tablespoons of salad dressing on a salad? It's unheard of, right? It's a ladle, and a ladle can be a half a cup. That's eight tablespoons. So it may be four times what they're quoting is what you can figure the fat and calories to be. But you have the option of using a fat-free salad dressing, and most salad bars do have those. And the reason I bring this up is that a lot of people go to the salad bar with the intention of eating healthy today. I had a friend that told me about they went to a drive-up window and her friend ordered a salad that day and she got the grilled chicken. The salad came with a package that was about twice this big of salad dressing and she out of curiosity read it and it had like 30 grams of fat in it. She might as well have the chicken sandwich. It would have a whole lot less fat in it than that salad dressing had. So if you're taking the salad bar route and you're covering your little mountain with snow and you've also added to it, what else do they have on salad bars? Macaroni salad, potato salad, coleslaw, and all those things with mayonnaise, which is more fat. Or you're getting fried zucchini, and fried mushrooms, and all those other things that are on salad bars now. You probably could have had the steak and french fries or baked potato for the fat grams that you got on the salad bar. So be aware of what you're doing. Be conscious of it. And maybe just a little moderation will go a long way. You also have choices of buying products that used to be full fat in the low fat version. For example, sour cream now can be bought fat free or light and they still taste really good and that can cut some fat and calories. Or you have cream cheese that comes light or fat free and they can also taste good and be used in cooking. A good oil to use in your diet is canola oil or olive oil. We used to tell people to use the polyunsaturated oils, uh, that would be cotton seeds, soybeans, sesame seed, sunflower, and, and those are not bad fats, but they do have one negative, and that is it brings down your HDL. Remember that HDL was the good guy, the one we wanted to keep high? So we, we changed our advice and suggested that people use these monounsaturated fats, which is the olive oil and the uh, canola oil. Now that's for seasoning or stir frying or baking, still using small amounts. We don't mean for you to take your fry daddy and fill it up with you know, one of his oils and say, well, it's okay, it was a good type of oil. 
I have uh, patients try those tricks all the time. Another trick that they like to do is they find out that foods like uh, those insoluble fiber, oats, oat bran, and dried beans and peas, are an excellent source of that fiber and they can help to bring down your cholesterol a little bit. It's also good for your blood sugars, so it's, it's a good product to use. So my patients, again, want to have their eggs, bacon, gravy, and sausage, along with their oatmeal to cancel that out. And it just doesn't work that way. It has to work in conjunction with a low-fat diet. This is another problem, especially the guys usually have. And this is what we as nutritionists consider a serving. These are the white meats. This is a three ounce portion. And for a lot of guys, that's your first bite, right? <laughs> How many times do you pick up a restaurant menu and it says 16 ounce T-bone, eight ounce ribeye, half chicken, two inch pork chop? And what about the commercials on television? Over and over again, you see, or in the magazines or newspapers, it's not a burger anymore, is it? It's three burgers, three patties, uh, six slices of bacon, all kinds of sauces, lots of cheese. Remember the Monster Burger? We did a health fair one time with the Monster Burger. It was over 1,000 calories we calculated from that one sandwich. You throw in the order of fries and the big drinks. You know, now, drinks aren't 12 ounces anymore. They're 72 ounce or 36 ounce. That one meal was over 2,000 calories. Now, a lot of people walk by and say, boy, that looks good. <laughs> so it's, it's the fast food industry that's taking a toll on us, and the portion sizes are significant. This is as much protein as the average individual needs. If two servings twice a day is more than enough. Average female needs about 46 grams of protein, men about 56 grams of protein a day. Now, I'm not talking about marathoners or people who work out heavily, but just regular people. And we can get that from our regular food and a couple of servings of protein or meat a day, three ounce size. And a lot of times you hear about, oh, you're bodybuilding, you've got to have all this extra protein. You take these protein supplements and they cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, Non-fat dry milk can do the same thing. It's a whole lot cheaper. So if you need extra protein, you can do it in a very inexpensive way. If you eat excess amount of protein, you can also overtax your kidneys. They have to get rid of all those extras that are left over. So you know, be careful if you're doing things like that. Portions, again, can be a problem. This is another good example. This is what the package on the ice cream says a serving is. How many of you ever had a serving of ice cream that size at home? Not likely, right? Uh, you get the cereal bowl and you round it off about like that. And you say, well, the package says it's only 100 calories. That's if you have this size serving. So watch your portions. This is what we call a serving of pasta. You ever gone to a pasta house and had a platter of spaghetti that little? It's usually a platter, right? My mom went to uh, Olive Garden one time and ordered a pasta dish. And being the little lady she was, she couldn't eat it, but she asked to take it home with her. The next day, she and my daughter ate off of it, and they still threw some away. They had served her enough to feed at least four people, but how many people would sit there and try to eat the entire thing because you were taught when you were small, you're supposed to clean your plate, right? And if you don't clean your plate and you're wasting food, that's a sin because there are people in other parts of the world who are starving. Now, I don't know how my not eating my food is going to help them, but <laughs> we've been brainwashed and programmed that we have to clean the plate. So we'll make every effort to eat every bite on that plate. Plus, you're paying a whole lot for it, right? Well, I figure you even get more for your money when you can feed three people off that one plate. So you can take it home, eat leftovers, and you got two meals at least for the price of one. So look at it that way instead. And you may be curious about my blob here. This is actually representative of five pounds of body fat, and it does weigh five pounds fat. Now, I don't use this to gross you out. I actually use this to tell you that if you are trying to lose weight, that we as nutritionists don't recommend you do it the way you hear all this advertising promoting. You know, people talk about you can lose 10 pounds in a week. That's not good. That's not healthy. I don't recommend that. And if you're losing that fast, you're not losing 10 pounds of fat. You're losing a lot of fluid and you're losing some muscle too. We never want to lose muscle. That's what helps keep our energy levels high and enable us to eat without gaining weight easily. So we exercise to build muscle as well as burn calories and we lose weight at the rate of about a pound a week. Now I know you're upset when you, I say just one pound a week. That doesn't sound very impressive. You'd like to lose faster than that. We want to put it on you know, over a period of time but we want to take it off by tomorrow, right? One pound a week it's not that bad when you consider in a month's time you've lost this. And that's pretty impressive because you think it in terms of numbers. And actually a pound is a volume. So if you're trying to lose weight, remember slow is best. 
do it the right way. If you decrease your calorie intake just a little bit every day, you start to lose weight in a gradual, slow way. If you decrease your calories a great deal every day, your body's going to start turning on all the alarms and it's going to say, something's wrong here. This is starvation mode. So what does it do when you're in starvation mode? It brings your metabolism down. And your metabolism is so slow that if you start eating normally again, you'll actually gain weight. What happens when people lose weight on crash diets? They always gain it back, plus some, and that's usually why, because they went on a real strict diet which was not recommended anyway. What's wrong with the way we eat vegetables in the South? Vegetables are great. Eat all the vegetables you want, but be careful what goes into them. Because this might be 25 calories, but if they're swimming in bacon grease or ham hock or lard or whatever, butter, then you probably add at least another 50 calories or more to those. In the South, I say it's not how it tastes. We don't want to slide down. We want those to turn dark because they've got so much fat on them. Here's another product that contains coconut oil. I forgot to mention earlier. This is the non-dairy creamers like you would put in your coffee. Now, Coffee Mate has taken it out of their, this main product. I think it's still in some of their specialty creamers, those flavored kind. But a lot of your store brands still do put the coconut oil in their products. And again, one of the more obvious things is the way the meat looks in your selection. If it's really red and lean, it doesn't have a lot of marbling in it, that's what you want. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what a lean cut of meat is. But what do we consider the best choices of meat? What's highly promoted on the restaurant menus? It's prime, prime rib, um, ribeye steaks. And why are they considered really good? Because they're juicy. And what makes them juicy? All that fat. So if it's heavily marbled, lots of fat on the outside, that's what is, it's kind of like basting the meat the whole time it's cooking. So even though you might trim it off just before you consume it, it did baste the meat during the cooking process. What's the best way to prepare your meats? We've obviously said don't fry them. How would you want to fix a meat? Elevate it. Put it on a rack. So if it's on a grill or a George Foreman grill, then the fat's going to drip away from it. It won't lay in its own skillet and cook back in its own grease. If it's in a pan, it's like frying in its own grease. What about the chicken? I mentioned earlier it was a better choice of meat. There are some specifics about that. What part of the chicken are you going to eat? The white meat, do you want to leave the skin on it? No, that's where the fat's located, and even better if you take it off before it's ever cooked. So white meat. What about organ meat? Good choice, bad choice? Bad choice, high in cholesterol. The average serving of, of liver, for example, is 500 milligrams of cholesterol. We only wanted 200 all day. A serving of brains, and I don't know if any of you eat brains, but that's an old-fashioned dish, brains and eggs, has over 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol in it, and then add your eggs in too. What about um, other sources of organ meat? Does everybody here in here eat liver or chicken livers? How many of you eat bologna or hot dogs? Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> what do you think they put in those things? <laughs> Leftovers, exactly. One of my farmers said everything about the snout and the nails. Uh, it's what they couldn't use again as lean meat. You grind it up and you put a lot of salt and spices and things in with it, and now you can sell it again. You don't have any waste. You use everything. So everything that wasn't sellable as lean meat is now in your bologna and your hot dogs. The only exception to that would be if it was like a healthy choice, uh, fat-free bologna or hot dogs, and that would be okay occasionally. Still full of salt, but that's another whole lecture. If you are using as an excuse you cannot eat healthy because you don't have time, uh, there are frozen dinners that are considered healthy. Uh, healthy Choice is one brand. It's uh, usually under 300 calories and it's low in fat. It's moderate in sodium. It's not salt free, but it's moderate. So that would be a quick and easy solution for you. Or you can make your own healthy sandwiches using uh, turkey or chicken or even lean ham if you're not watching your salt intake. And there's tuna that you can buy packed in water. There's even peanut butters that are natural. You may have thought this was spoiled peanut butter. In truth, this is real peanut butter. Uh, this is what happens if you grind up peanuts. The pulp settles to the bottom and the oil rises to the top. Now, why do you think the peanut butter today doesn't look like that anymore? Somebody decided this was a lot of trouble. You've got to stir this. And, and it really doesn't spread very easily on that bread. It's hard to get it to spread. So, 
somebody came up with an idea to make it spread easily. You know what that idea was a long time ago? We'll add something to it and make it spread easily. Let's just throw some lard in there. Now it spreads real easily. So the peanut butter that we were eating some years back was always, it called it hardened fats on the label, but it was lard. Then we started complaining about that, so they started putting shortening in it. You know the story behind shortening. So the better peanut butter is this peanut butter, or, and it's called natural or old-fashioned. Smucker's is one brand you can find in most every store. Or you can do reduced fat, and that at least has less fat added to it. What about the uh, products that taste like they're the real thing, but they really aren't? One example is the, the fat substitutes, Olestra. Olestra was designed so you could have potato chips that taste like the real thing. They're not baked, they taste like fried potato chips, but they don't contribute fat or calories to your diet. It's okay, there's a whole lot less calories. It's only 55 calories and zero grams of fat, so you can do this, but I would recommend moderation. How many of you have read the label? This is something you want to use the serving size for sure, because the original label even said uh, it can cause anal leakage if you get too much. So it's one of those things, if you're not absorbing it, what are you doing? <laughs> you're going to excrete it. <laughs> so be careful when you eat these. It's all right to have them, but just remember, caution. And if you already have an intestinal problem, you may not want to use those. And again, the original fast food probably is, is your fruit. Uh, it doesn't require any preparation, just clean it, and you can even eat it in the car, you can eat it on the run, and we probably don't eat nearly enough vegetables and fruits in our diet in America anyway. So when you're in a hurry, grab some fruit, think in terms of some of the things I've t shared with you today. Um, you used to have to make, if you wanted a low-fat dessert, you had to make your own. Now you don't even have to do that. You can buy things like Rice Krispie Treats. Snapwell has a lot of fat-free products. Uh, these cookies are a good example. But the problem with this is, a lot of people assume that if it's fat-free, it's calorie-free, or it's fine to use it. And I had one lady storm into my office one, time, one day, very indignant. She said, I have gained 20 pounds on fat-free food. Well, what happens is fat does give us a satisfying feeling. It stays in our stomach longer, and we're, we have satiety is what it's called. And what she didn't realize is that she was eating probably a box of these at a time, and there's 50 calories in one cookie. So just because it's fat-free doesn't mean that we can eat all we want of them. Just keep that in mind. A little bit, again, is okay. Moderation. Remember, cocoa has most of the fat removed, so if you do want something chocolate, that's a good route to go. And I think I've used every prop up here today, so I'm ready for questions. Anybody have any questions for me? Yes. What do you mean by cholesterol supplements? A pill for cholesterol? I, I guess I'm not familiar with it to be able to answer. Um, some of the medications that patients take can help to improve their, brings down their cholesterol. Uh, sometimes in doing that, it doesn't bring up their HDL. It, it takes it down too, so that's one of the negatives of it. Some medicines are better for triglycerides and cholesterol. Some are for one or the other. The supplements you're referring to, I'm not familiar with, so I can't address those. Just be very careful when you buy something from one of these places that may not be FDA approved or may have claims that are not verified by scientific studies. Just be real careful of that. Uh, like I mentioned before, there are products like soluble fiber that can bring down cholesterol and that may be something along those lines. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Do you recommend uh, journaling uh, in order to see what... Like keeping a diary of your food intake? For someone who's trying to lose weight, that's a good idea. It's so like I said with the, the potometer and the exercise. You know, I'm, I'm a visual person, so I always like to write down exactly what I've done so I can see it year after year. So journaling is a good idea. The only time I wouldn't recommend that is if someone has an eating disorder and then we're still focusing on food and I try to get the focus off of food. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I like the idea. Any other? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question because fats can be good fat and not have any cholesterol in them at all. For example, this is an oil. It's total fat, but there's no cholesterol. You can only get cholesterol from an animal product. And I think that's kind of humorous sometimes in the grocery store. They will label things no cholesterol that never did have cholesterol, and that's good. I mean, it tells you that's a great product to use. I saw a sticker on bananas one time that said no cholesterol. 
And that's true, fruits are great because they never did have cholesterol in them. It doesn't make that brand of bananas unique or special, it just means fruits don't have cholesterol in them. So you can have fat-free salad dressings, uh, and then they won't have any cholesterol, but you can have them cholesterol-free that still have full fat. So you see the difference? So you can have good fats and fats that have no cholesterol, but if it's fat-free, it won't have cholesterol at all. And it does get confusing, and I don't really recommend that percentage. I don't know how many people use that, but I find that very confusing because it, it's based on Jane Doe and John Doe, and none of us are her or him. And uh, sometimes that's real confusing as to whether you've had enough. I like to look at the total amount of fat grams or calories or grams of carbohydrate and just kind of keep up with it that way if I'm going to use that information. If, if I could just summarize in, in a few words what I've said today to you is be aware of what you're eating. I don't want to scare you and keep you from eating any of these foods. I eat everything I want also, but I try to keep one thing in mind, and that's moderation. You know, if I want to eat fried foods on a Friday night when I go out, I will. I'll watch out and see if anybody's looking. But, but moderation is okay. It's not what we eat you know, occasionally that hurts us. It's what we do day in and day out. And the other part of that is exercise is so very important. Uh, if you're not getting enough exercise, wear a pedometer, journal it, write it down. Make sure that you get enough exercise to keep you healthy because that's a, one of our biggest problems in this nation is we're just not getting enough exercise. Um, and that, that's, on that I will conclude. And thank you very much for your attention. You have a great audience.